Hello, Monetization Nation. Tim Ash is a best-selling author and expert on landing page optimization. His knowledge of persuasion and online marketing has produced more than $1.2 billion of value for his clients. He has presented at more than 200 events. His most recent book, Unleash Your Primal Brain, was released last month. In today's episode, Tim explains some of his secrets about creating successful landing pages. Tectonic shifts are constantly transforming the earth and business, causing destruction and huge growth opportunities. I'm Nathan William, the host of Monetization Nation, where we learn how to leverage business tectonic shifts to transform monetization. Here on the show today, I have Tim Ash. Tim is a keynote speaker and a best-selling author. Uh, the first book I ever purchased from Tim, I purchased probably 12 years ago, and it was the first version of his landing page optimization book, and it was um, then replaced by by this version of his landing page optimization book. Um, <laughs> the second which, edition. Yeah, the second edition. And uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for the secrets and stories that he shared in it. And I'm honored to have him on the show today um, to teach us some of his stories and secrets about landing page optimization. But before we go into that, uh, Tim has a new book uh, that is about to be released. We're recording this before it hits shelves, but I'm going to publish this episode the week that his book hits shelves. And his new book is called Unleash Your Primal Brain. Uh, Tim, you want to tell us a little bit about your new book before? Yeah, we absolutely. Glad to. Um, well, as, as you mentioned, I've written a couple of best-selling books on landing page optimization, so I'm really known in the kind of conversion rate optimization, digital marketing community, um, and you know, my former agency. We created about 1.2 billion in value for clients um, using what are essentially neuromarketing techniques. And so I wanted to step back from the work part and say. Uh, return to my first love, which is how does the brain really work? How do you persuade people? And for me, the through line to that is evolutionary psychology. In other words, the brain didn't just pop into being, you know, we picked up stuff from earlier life forms along the way. And there's definitely some things that make us bizarrely and uniquely human. But this book describes that whole arc, everything from memory to uh, language, the culture, gender differences, brain chemistry, learning, all of that's in there, but in a very digestible way. What are the key takeaways that an entrepreneur would get by reading that book? Well, to be clear, it's not an applied book per se. So it could, you can use it for definitely for business, for leadership, marketing, sales, persuasion, organization building. You can use it for personal relationships. You can use it for uh, having a better understanding of yourself and um personal development as well. But if you'd read it for marketing with that prism on it, then you learn a lot. You learn how to influence people, the fact that our subconscious mind is really in charge, um, how we make various kinds of shortcuts and in our decision-making that people can take advantage of and where those came from. So instead of trying a bunch of tactical little digital marketing tricks, you know, the 37 ways to manipulate people with behavioral economics or something like that. By reading this book, you'll actually get a deep understanding of what we're trying to influence, which is the human brain. It sounds great. So listeners and watchers, uh, go out today and buy his book, his brand new book, Unleash Your Primal Brain. Are you doing an audiobook version of it? Oh, it's already out. Uh, so is the ebook version. And uh, yeah, you, you get all the information at primalbrain.com. That's the website. Right. That's got links to everything. The first question I have for you is just really basic. You know, what is a landing page? Explain that from your perspective to my audience. Well, a lot of people use landing page in contrast to a full on website. So it's specifically designed to kind of catch inbound traffic from a campaign you're running. Uh, you might be paying to get people to your landing page. But I have a broader definition, which is it's any page um, that has significant potential to have economic value flow through it. So in that sense, it could be a campaign-specific standalone landing page. I call those catcher's mitts that are just out there catching traffic. Or it could be the homepage of your website. Yeah. Um, or if you're a catalog, an e-commerce catalog that's 
indexed in a bunch of shopping search engines, your product detail page might be a landing page because all of that traffic from the shopping engine feeds are going directly to deep linked um, product detail pages on your site. So the template for that product detail page uh, might be one of your most important front doors. So to me, a landing page is any page which is channeling significant traffic that might have economic value for you. Sounds great. In today's world, people use the term funnel. In recent years, people have used the term funnel a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems like funnel and landing page are in many ways the same thing and overlap a lot. How do, how do you see the difference and the similarities between a landing page and a funnel? Well, uh, when I've heard the term funnel used, uh, I've heard the term funnel pages or squeeze pages and, and various related terms. But to me, a funnel is really more of a definition of a business process. So for example, they'll land here, they'll get a free download, but then I'll get their email in exchange, then I'll email yep. them. And then eventually I'll ask them for the wallet opener and ask, ask them for their first dollar. And then I'll have an upsell and then the big yep. upsell after that. So it's really kind of an escalating business process where you're asking people to self-select into the next step of it. So it's, um, it's not along the way, you're going to have a number of landing pages for each of those particular steps. That's right. So the landing page is one element, a very essential element of the funnel creation process. Yes, absolutely. And then the other one would be the communication that you're using uh, in between the going to the landing pages, which is primarily these days, I would say, focused in email communication. That's right. So, so your email sequences are critical as well. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So talk to me about what problem a landing page is intended to solve. Um, the problem of your company not making enough money. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, a landing page, well, well there's, there's no such thing as a, like the perfect landing page or a generic landing page. A landing page exists for a particular purpose. So the question is, does it meet the needs of the intended audience? And do a high percentage of the visitors um, act and do the thing that you want them to do? So from the business's standpoint, um, the point of the landing page is to align with the goals of the visitors and to have them take action. Now that action can be maybe watch a video, download something, buy something. It could be pick up the phone and call us or um, schedule a demo or any number of things. So whatever your conversion action is, the landing page is designed to be as persuasive as possible to get the highest percentage of people to take that action. Your book expresses this very well. Uh, what do you teach are some of the best practices or best elements of a landing page? Um, well, again, I don't know if it's a catalog of, of items. I, th I think the most important thing is the approach. And the biggest mistake that I see marketers continue to make is that we're talking about stuff that's in our own self-interest as marketers. You know, we're great. This is the world's um, best solution for you know, whatever, fill in the blank. And we're just tooting our own horn. We're broadcasting at people and we're saying, buy it now. Only three easy payments of 1995 plus shipping and handling. You know, we're just, it's, we confuse a hard sell with something that's effective. And it's because we have this inside out mentality. We're inside the business and we're broadcasting out. And instead, I think the key to an effective landing page is having an outside in mentality. In other words, some people are showing up on your page. You don't know whether they're educated, confused, busy, tired. Okay, take them where they are. Now convince them. And so it's really having that user-centered focus. Uh, what are the problems? What are the, the needs that the person has potentially? And so a well-designed landing page is going to address the needs of the person. And only by doing that can you make more money as a business. Talk to me about text versus video. I know for a long time there, a lot of landing pages were huge 10 page sale letters, sales letters that went on forever. And I know there seems to be much more of a trend today with, with video to try to communicate that information. How do you feel with in the text versus video argument on the landing page? Well, I don't know that there is an argument. Again, it's the right tool for the right job. Um, I'd say it depends on where people are coming in from. So one thing you have to consider is the medium. If you're 
um, have a cell phone, then you're going to come in on um, your phone screen and reading a bunch of teeny tiny text. It probably looks like about two and a half point font when you look at it on, on most phones is obviously not the best way to get people to engage. On the other hand, we're all used to watching YouTube or TikTok videos or streaming you know, our favorite Netflix series for hours and hours. So we're used to watching video on a cell phone. So the take rate of people watching a video on a cell phone is much higher than it is on a desktop or a laptop because we're not going to sit in front of our computer to watch a movie or to watch videos. And the quality is fine, but it's just not what we think of doing in that context. So I think videos are much more effective in a mobile experience. Um, there's still plenty of room for long form sales copy on websites though. What do you think are the biggest mistakes that people make on their landing pages? Ah, well, in addition to, like I said, not really addressing the needs of your visitors, which is number one, I'd say the visual clutter. Uh, this is uh, death by a thousand cuts. You know, we, we get bored with our own pages. We start decorating them. Um, drop shadow on the button, you know, or yeah. whatever, just obnoxious, extraneous detail and visual boogers, I call them, all over your page and not having a, a sense of priorities. So I, I, if, to me, a landing page should have a zen-like stillness out of which the call to action naturally arises. Now, how often have you actually gone to a landing page that you can describe as having that quality of zen like started stillness. meditating while i was at the site right? <laughs> yeah it's just not very often so we're our own worst enemy and i think the confusion comes from the fact that to get someone to our site we often have to interrupt them and we're doing that in a public setting with some obnoxious display ad or something that's competing for attention absolutely to grab my attention you should be obnoxious and and interrupt driven but once I get to your own website or landing page, it should be a bullshit free zone. It should be calm and you shouldn't have to compete with yourself for attention on the page. Figure out what's important, make that more visually prominent and tone everything else down. So I'd say just um, taking a machete to all of the clutter on your, on your website is, is step one. So simplify, simplify, simplify. Yeah, until it's boring and, and your graphic designers yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, you know, you, you couldn't make your living as an artist and you have to design another button on a web page. Oh. Sorry, that's, you know, the goal is to put money in my bank account, not for you to express yourself creatively. And so for the people like me that, that tend to make things more complicated than they need to be, uh, the secret strategy that helps me is I build it and sometimes it's too complicated, but I put a heat map on it. And I did this today. And then you go through the heat map data and then you remove all the elements that people aren't clicking on and using and, and you, you bump things up based on what's used um, more and bump, remove things based on what's used less. And it seems like heat map data is a very effective way to help yeah, us. Yeah, support. but you're talking about fixing a known problem after the fact. I yeah, mean, that's it, true. It's like a, the heat map is telling me that I should have cut a bunch of extraneous stuff out in the first place. Well, yeah, thank you, Captain Obvious. Yes, you should have. So I don't think you need to go through that step. Um, also, heat maps are limited in that they only tell you there, there's a strong bias towards the top of the page or the current screen full and things like that. So they can't tell you how people would have reacted to things that are off the screen currently. Yeah. Not getting, it there's only a tiny up. percentage of people are scrolling down and even seeing that. So they're not necessarily even a good tool. Uh, I'd say just really, really have the discipline to just strip things away. So to me, a direct response landing page, if you want to limit it to that, has to have everything on the on one screen visible, whatever your screen is, you know, desktop or or mobile. Um, and then it has to have three elements, what I call the Holy Trinity. It's not a religious reference, but uh, the first thing is you should know what the page is about. If there's a form, you should know what um, the benefit of filling out the form is. And if there's a call to action, it should fulfill one of my needs. So the visual priorities are what's the page about? That's the headline. What's the form asking me to do? That's the form subheadline. And what happens when I press the button? And that should be stated in terms of what's useful to the visitor. What do they get out of it? So if, if you have those three things as your top three visually prominent things on the page, 
you win and anything else just needs to go. And how about visual elements? Do you usually have a video there, an image there? What, what well, well, again, it's, it, look, if you have something really complicated and it takes a four minute video to explain it, okay, maybe you need to put your video up front, but um, everybody's using like video backgrounds and just visual noise, you know, uh, yep. a bunch of enhancements that you certainly don't need. Autoplay videos are, are horrible. I would never use one of those. I have not yet to find an exception to using an autoplay video. Um, so yeah, again, you're, you're talking about what elements to put on the page, assuming that they should be on there somewhere. And I'm just saying, why? What's yeah. your compelling reason for having an image or a video? Unless you, have, you can answer that clearly, it shouldn't be there. In your consulting practice, any stories that you're able to share or from your book, stories that you'd like to share of, of companies that did a really good job of implementing or improving a landing page and, and seeing some great results from that? Well, so if you look at it from an evolutionary psychology standpoint, stories basically serve two purposes for people. The first is rehearsal. Uh, so when we go to the movies, we you know, read a book um, or play a video game, we're getting kind of secondhand experience. Uh, it allows us to learn something without the bad consequences of, of, happening, of it happening in real life. Like if I were to, if the bear's chasing me, um, I don't want to face that in real life. But if I hear a story of how to get away from the bear from a friend of mine, that's helpful. So stories are there to essentially give us practice and to rehearse things, if you will. Okay. Um, and, and, and that's important. And that's for all animals, not just, not just people. But the purely human part of storytelling is stories reinforce the cultural values of whatever tribe we're in. And that's really, really important because people aren't designed to survive on their own. We're really hyper social. It's really a warfare of tribe against tribe. And the most cohesive tribe wins. So stories tend to reinforce cultural values. You've probably seen that in our national politics recently, for example. Yes. People will stick to their stories no matter what. Okay, reality be damned. And I think that's uh, important to understand the evolutionary pressure that created that, which is we want our group to seamlessly pass cultural knowledge, which means you're not allowed to question stories. You just have to parrot them and pass them on. And, and then you're being a good team player. I've recognized the value of stories and storytelling um, in our marketing, but I have not really thought through the value of storytelling in tribal cohesion. That's uh, I'll give you a perfect example that I use in my book, which is uh, I'll tell you an objective story right now. Okay, you ready? Mm -hmm. So the matador faced the bull in the arena. When the bull charged, he definitely sidestepped a few inches and plunged his sword between the, the bull's shoulder blades, striking its heart and killing it instantly. Okay. Now that's okay. an objective story in the sense of, you know, you could put a video recorder on that and record that experience. Right. But now let's consider two different audiences. Let's say I'm in Spain and uh, you know, I'm a fan of bullfighting. Well, to me, that story is about man versus raw nature, about courage, about being an impeccable warrior tradition, a bunch of positive things. You tell that same story to someone from PETA, people for the ethical treatment of animals, and they're going to think that this is wanton animal torture and cruelty and murder, and it's being subsidized by these people paying uh, for the tickets, and it should be ended immediately. Yep. Right? It's the same story. How it's experienced depends on the cultural frame of the person experiencing. So where this is important for marketers is that we need to understand exactly who we're talking to. Most marketers say, here's my product. Let me yell to the world about uh, how great it is and everybody should buy it. Well, if you're actually going to be an effective marketer, you should start with, who is my tribe? What are their values would be the next step? What's important to them? And then what products and services should I design for them or how should I talk about them in order to resonate for that tribe? That is so That's profound, so powerful. Can you think of an example of someone that did that really well? Well, there, there are a lot of brands. I mean, if you want to cult like followings, Apple is one of the world's um, highly, most highly valued stock companies for a reason. You know, you know, I, I like to get work done uh, on my wonderful Samsung Galaxy S20 Plus. Um, but, you know, Apple people, you know, they're just part of the Apple religion. And they've done a real good job at Apple saying, you know, you're cool if you're Apple. 
if you're cool if you have Apple products. And I guess I'm not cool, but I'm okay with that because I love my actual phone. It's usually a generation or two more advanced than Apple and it costs less. So, but you know, if you're drinking the proverbial Kool-Aid, you know, you're an Apple person. I just started a holy war by saying that, you know, you, um, another one would be REI. I mean, if you, you know, it's about outdoors. It's about the cultural values are about preserving nature. Um, so you can bet that they're going to be against global warming. They're going to support sustainable everything and so on. And so if you're in that tribe, you're going to be attracted to that brand versus the Gucci tribe, which is all about conspicuous okay. consumption. Those are great examples. I just noticed behind you on the wall, what is behind you? Those are all your name placards or whatever you call those name badges from all yeah. the conferences you've gone to and spoken at. And that's pretty impressive. Yeah, thank you. I probably have a couple of hundred of them. It goes past the viewing area there. It's cheaper than wallpaper. Um, but actually that's another great marketing principle since you bring it up, which is um, trust has to precede the conversation. Whenever you get on a video call with me, you're going to see those badges. And I don't have yeah. to tell you that I'm, I know what I'm talking about because that wall speaks for itself. So another thing that marketers can take advantage of is um, badges that indicate various kinds of trust, whether it's transactional trust or third-party credibility or testimonials, awards, uh, that kind of stuff can be really, really powerful. Instead of you saying you're great, other yeah. people saying you're great. Thank you so much, Tim, for sharing your stories and knowledge with us today. Here's some of my key takeaways from this episode. Number one, our landing page needs to have a single central purpose. Number two, our landing page needs to be focused on solving a problem for our audience. Number three, our landing page needs to have a strong CTA or a call to action with clear benefits for our visitors. Number four, our landing page needs to be simple. We need to cut out clutter. Everything on our page should align with our central goal. And number five, our landing page needs to establish trust. If you enjoyed this interview and want to learn more about Tim or connect with him, you can visit timash.com. You can also listen to part two of this episode. And for more about his latest book, you can go to primalbrain.com. Did you like today's episode? Then please follow these channels to receive free digital monetization content. Number one, you can get a free monetization assessment of your business or subscribe to the free monetization e-magazine at monetizationnation.com. Number two, you can subscribe to the Monetization Nation podcast or YouTube channel. And number three, you can connect with me, Nathan William, on LinkedIn. What elements do you include on your landing pages? Do you implement the same key things that Tim does? Please join our private Monetization Nation Facebook group and share your insights with other digital monetizers. Thanks for joining me for this episode. I wish you success in your content marketing. Do you want to become a better digital monetizer? To receive great monetization stories and secrets, please go to monetizationnation.com and join free. And if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the show and share it.